This is the talk for IC squared on HTML5 exploits and defenses. Now the agenda is we're going to go through a little bit of background on what exactly HTML5 is. Then we're going to talk about some HTML5 exploits, additional attack vectors, and look at the countermeasures appropriate for each. And then finally, the last section, we're going to talk about how penetration testing can be done with HTML5 applications. Now first, a little bit of background on HTML5. So what exactly is it? Well, this is a newer version of the original HTML markup language that we all know and love that is used on the internet. Now this new version allows for an immediate response to our end user. There's no need for any kind of refresh or reload of the page. It was officially published by the W3C and finalized in October of 2014. Now W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium and they are known for such HTML standards. Now the thing that's appealing about HTML5 and why so many companies are going to languages that support it is because you can take the same functionality and basically reuse that functionality on many different platforms, meaning different devices. So whether you're writing your code for a website, a mobile device, or a tablet, you can basically reuse the same HTML5 components. Now, how can someone program in HTML5? Well, basically, there are several different components uh, as well as concepts that are incorporated into many different frameworks, and they are full-fledged frameworks. Now, some of the most popular ones that are used today include Node.js, which is commonly just referred to as Node, AngularJS and ReactJS. Now, one thing to note is Node.js is written by the Linux Foundation. AngularJS is written by Google. And React is written by Facebook. Um, there, there are some differences between these languages. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details behind them, but just realize that they do provide that immediate gratification and the deployment of HTML components on the different devices that we spoke of. Now let's take a look at some of the HTML5 exploits, additional attack vectors, and then appropriate countermeasures for each. Now realize that there are a lot of exploit cho choices available in HTML5, we still have some of the old favorites, cross-site scripting, and this includes types 1, 2, and 3. We have NoSQL injection for those areas that also incorporate the NoSQL databases. We have something new called server-side JavaScript injection, which seems like an, like an oxymoron since we know that JavaScript actually runs on the client side. Uh, but when those attributes are actually shifted to the server side, uh, that's where the injection could possibly occur. Another old time favorite is our cross-site request forgery or CSERF. And there's different new attack vectors to come at that. We're actually going to look at one of these. Storage, data exposure, and many more. Now first, we're going to get into the exploits. So I've got three HTML5 exploits we're going to go through. After we go through those, then I will explain more about the different HTML5 attack vectors. So first, command injection. We're going to talk about command injection uh, specifically in regards to a recent exploit. So just recently, as in the beginning of January 2016, the Trend Micro Company, which is a company that provides antivirus solutions and firewalls and things like that, actually had an exploit that was done against Node.js, or commonly known as, known as Node. 
So the issue, uh, which was recorded as number 693, trend micro node.js HTTP server listening on local host can execute commands. Basically, what would happen is when you would install the trend micro antivirus onto Windows, it automatically would install a default component known as password manager. Now, this password manager product was written primarily with JavaScript and the Node.js. Now, using that Node.js server, there basically was this opening of multiple HTTP RPC ports. RPC obviously standing for stands for remote procedure calls. And what that did is it would allow for the handling of API requests or basically requests coming in from third-party APIs. Now, according to the security researcher, it only took him about 30 seconds to spot one of these API calls that would permit arbitrary command injection. What does that mean? It means it's giving power to the user to basically execute any command they wanted on that local host. So this arbitrary command injection would eventually map to a shell exec method or function that allowed that website to then launch any command controlled uh, by the attacker. And you can see the sample code here. This is your standard Ajax code. You've got uh, a new XML HTTP request where we do an open and following the URL there, you see the question mark and you see then the command to basically in this case, just execute calc.exe, but that's just for demonstrative purposes. The point here is that any command could then be sent by the attacker to be executed on that machine where the micro, where the trend micro antivirus password manager is installed. This is just a snapshot of what that password manager software looked like. You can read more details about this particular exploit on any of these links that I've provided here. Now, in regards to countermeasures, what should the programmers have done? Well, obviously one technique you can use is you can validate the origin of all your requests, meaning the commands that come in, uh, and you can do that on the server side, but realize you've got to use pieces of information that are not easily exploitable. If you use something like the origin header, that's very easy for attackers to spoof. So you don't want to do that. You want to val validate the origin, uh, usually against some sort of whitelist of acceptable servers. And of course, this would be done on the server side only. Uh, the setup of the acceptable servers could be something that's done maybe during the installation, uh, maybe something that could be configured. And then finally, you want to validate the listing of commands that can actually be performed. One way that this could be done is to provide a dropdown of allowable commands. Just a couple of, just some ideas that, of some possible countermeasures to address this exploit. Now let's take a look at cross-site scripting combined with sandbox escaping. Now, first of all, what is a sandbox? So if you look at the top box, you can see that without a sandbox, when application code is run inside of a browser, it can easily have access to anything that's on your system, on your laptop, where that browser is running read and write permissions. But with a sandbox, uh, that application code is to be contained within the context of your browser and not have access to your laptop. So keep that in mind as we look at the next exploit. Now, a little bit of background about Angular code. It uses something called double curly braces. This is just the way that it holds expressions inside uh, that need to be executed. So you can take a look at this example here. First of all, I'm pointing out in the first red box that 
Uh, this is the script that you need to actually declare in order to use Angular. And then you'll notice in the second red box that I have the double curly braces. I also have the uh, ng-app, that's sort of the distinguishing characteristic of AngularJS uh, denoting where execution of Angular code is going to occur. So in this particular example, the text input of 2 plus 4 is evaluated by Angular, which then displays the output of 6. Now, if an attacker is able to inject their code inside of these double curly braces, then obviously they're going to be able to do a cross-site scripting attack, right? They're going to be in control of the JavaScript. Now, this may not be any big deal because everything within Ang Angular runs within a sandbox. However, if an attacker could combine the arbitrary execution of their own JavaScript with a sandbox escape, then we know we could have a real problem. Well, this is exactly what was done. So basically, a security researcher was able to compromise the Angular sanitizer. Now, this Angular sanitizer is basically a component of the sandbox, and it applies whitelisting on elements and attributes that are inside of the DOM. Basically, the security researcher found that it was possible to reuse existing functions to break that sanitizer and then inject their own attacker controlled values. Now, once that was possible, they basically injected their own attacker controlled iframe and an iframe is just a portion of a web page. Um, but within that, they could then uh, execute anything that they want. And they basically um, uh, use this technique to then uh, do the sandbox escaping. I encourage you to read more about the exploit at the link that I've provided below. Now, in regards to countermeasures for this particular uh, exploit, for Angular, programmers need to treat curly braces in user input as highly dangerous, right? and also avoid that immediate server-side reflection of user input, right? So make sure that anything received uh, from the client side is validated on the server side before reflected back. Now the security researcher was able to bypass the sandbox in this particular example because there was no validation of a return value from one of the native functions. So developers need to always validate that they are getting back what they expect. For example, if your return value is supposed to be an integer, make sure that you're getting back an integer. Uh, and if you don't, throw the exception. Now the final HTML5 exploit we're going to look at is cross-site request forgery via cores to perform same origin policy bypasses.